Hello? 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 Is this thing on? <laughs> How did you like s'mores? <laughs> we'll probably take s'mores out in... Uh, let's say probably 30 minutes, but he's, we've been playing a lot, so he probably is getting tired pretty soon here, so we'll see. Uh, let me, uh, let me tell Twitter that I'm streaming, but yeah, you've been a good boy. You've been a good boy, Twitter. Live now, doing some uh, Linux virtual memory manager uh, experiments by using processes instead of threads. Maybe a custom allocator too. Okay, stream link. Also live on Twitch and YouTube. Okay, all the streams look healthy. Um, everything looks good on my end. Okay. Yeah, S'mores should probably end up sleeping here for a pretty good amount of time. But if he doesn't, then we'll keep taking him out. But we'll keep an eye on him. He likes to sleep on the tiles right where the camera is pointed. Um, he'll probably end up migrating there with a little bit of time because that's that's his favorite spot, probably because it's hard and cold and not the bed that I bought for him, you know? Why is he in jail? Well, he's been too cute is the problem. You know what's weird is I've never seen him. Um, I've never had a camera set up, so I've never seen like what he does behind closed doors because I can't see him from my desk, which sounds bad, but it's actually pretty good. Um, I I've been spending I've been sleeping on the couch, so I'm right next to him, so he can like wake me up. But when I am on the couch, if he catches a glimpse of my face. He can't sleep or play or anything. So he has to, he has to um, not be able to see me to be himself. He gets too excited. <laughs> so we're learning so much about s'mores. He's such a good boy. The only thing we're working on is he's got some runny poops. So I've got some fiber for him because he really, I have a salmon and lamb for him, a wet food, as well as a chicken and something. He doesn't like the chicken as much, but he is starting to eat it. I put out a little bit for both. 
Uh, the salmon and lamb is so rich for him because uh, it's just oily and fatty. He ends up just... Um, I think that's what's giving him runny poops, but it's what he likes. It's what he likes. So I'm trying to get him some fiber. I'm making sure he eats his dry food before I give him wet food. And if he doesn't eat enough dry food, then I don't give him wet food for that meal. I don't know. I'm, I'm learning. I'm trying. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> if I knew what I was doing, I would, uh, I would try and try and do that. But from my experience, and maybe this is just from my experience programming, most of the people who confidently have solutions and techniques to solve all of these problems typically just have something that works for them. But it's not, and they preach very strongly, but it's obvious that all dogs are different. So, but he's a little puppy and he's grown fast. He is visibly... And by feel getting so much bigger every day. So much bigger every single day. Carrying him down the stairs. He has like three stairs to go outside, which he will do on his own. He'll do those stairs on his own. But I try to never let him do the stairs if I can get there and and carry him. Because um, burners have really bad hips. And his hips won't fuse for like a year. So we're going to try and be really gentle on his hips and his joints. So. But yeah. So I've got all the chats up. Um, stream quality in Twitch and here seems very similar. Yeah, that's probably about right. Um. It's probably the same quality on the default setting. If you go, YouTube should be in 4K and stream.bfa.lk should be in 4K, but it's not 4K by default. You will have to select that option specifically, which is totally okay. How old is he? He is nine weeks old. <laughs> nine weeks old. Is that not crazy? He is a really, really good boy. Um, okay, let's... Uh, I know you can't see the screen yet. Let me get my terminal font set to a more reasonable font for stream. I think this is good. Okay. And let's make sure I don't have any, anything that I don't want to leak on stream. Like my nudes. And it looks pretty good. Okay. So hopefully I can go to this and s'mores will stay. Good boy. Good boy. Okay. And I don't check my stream preview too often. So, chat, it's going to be on you to let me know if s'mores is getting up and moving around. Because I think the next time he gets up, given that he goes to sleep and he's not just laying down, if he goes to sleep, the next time he gets up, I gotta go and take him outside. So. <laughs> Is he not the cutest boy? <laughs> he needs a brother. Oh. Nine weeks and he's already that big. He's gonna be huge. Yeah, he was the biggest of the litter. Is that not just crazy? And let's uh, resize this to here. There we go. I just stuff a terminal up here. Honestly, what we can do is probably go a little bit be bigger on the doggo cam until this is uh, the right size. How does that look, chat? A little bit more. Okay, as long as I stay in these two terminals, uh, I should never worry about anything getting covered up by Mr. S'mores. What books are you currently reading? Um, I am still finishing the audiobooks of Harry Potter. Um, I'm on the seventh book, and I keep kind of pausing it. I listen to it when I go out into the garage to do some machining stuff. Um, but ever since I got s'mores, I haven't gone in the garage because I don't want to be 
I don't want to be far away for too long. I should be able to go away for about two hours at a time now. Last night, we experimented with two and a half hours between uh, me waking up and checking on him. Um, and he did great uh, last night. He does very good in his pen. If he leaves his pen, if I open these gates, I'm calling the room his pen and his crate, obviously his crate. But when I let him out of his pen he he'll have an accident but i don't even consider it an accident because it's not a panic or hesitation or him holding it too long he just goes which means that he obviously just thinks that going outside of his pen is outside and it i that's going to be something we'll have to work on but i don't even really consider that an accident uh the last accident he had inside of his pen was i think four days ago and it's when he had some explosive diarrhea. And so I can't really blame him for that either because he can't really hold it. And I think I think he walked up to the gate and he looked at me and I had a friend over. So I was like continuing a conversation. I just thought he wanted to say hi, but obviously he needed to go out immediately. But he didn't know how to signal the urgency of that yet. And I, I still don't think he quite knows how to signal urgency yet but he is being a very good boy so yes i'm using sway i love it i love the wayland and sway ecosystem i'm working on a new uh install right now that's going to be system d based and i think i'm getting rid of uh se linux mls because mls it just causes too many problems on a workstation, on a server. I'm sure it's great on a like web server and a VM server. It's like ideal. On a workstation, there's too many applications that drop cache files, and it, it they do not handle it well when that cache file uh, is different permissions for the same user. Right? Every application basically assumes that if you can touch the file as a user that you'll be able to always access that file from the application. And with MLS, that's not the case. So I think I'm going to switch away from MLS and I'm going to go to a standard SE Linux policy. But now that I know how to write my own SE Linux policies, it won't be very hard for me to make a type for like uh, higher privilege areas. And then I'll be able to give that basically a, a superset of permissions from my normal users such that my normal user will just be able to access a little bit more stuff when I drop into that mode. Um, so, yeah. Oh man, I had the same with my dog when she was a puppy. I was working from home and she came into the room, looked looked at me and whining a bit for, and like two seconds later she's shitting on the floor because she couldn't hold it any longer. Yeah. And that was the last accident that he had. And that was like three or four days ago, which is incredible. So I have some, I got some fiber supplements for him. They're meant for 12 weeks old and beyond. But since he's such a big boy, I'm, I'm just following the size and weight requirements. I'm, I'm sure he'll be fine. So I'm just following that. And hopefully that will kind of help get him thickened up. Because I want to feed him the food. To me, and maybe this is wrong. Maybe it's inaccurate. But my view is I would rather him eat... A lot of the food that he likes, the salmon, and then have some have some poop issues as long as he's drinking water so he's not getting dehydrated. I'd rather that at a super young age than him having healthy stools, but being um, not getting enough food because he needs to be putting on like multiple pounds a week. And I'm way more concerned about his food intake than my convenience of of taking him outside a little bit more. So. <laughs> uh, thoughts on NixOS? I have no thoughts on it. I've never used it, never really looked into it. So I am always anxious that I'm not doing enough for s'mores because that's how I am with everything in life. I wish... That weren't the case. So, but like most things in life, that that concern will probably lead to me being a pretty good, a pretty good teacher. So.
He's losing electrolytes that way. He needs saltier stuff. Interesting. Okay. Eating enough calories is most important. Yeah, I'm trying a bunch of things. That being said, he's doing a lot better in the past couple days. I've been making sure he eats a lot more of his dry food. He's become a little less picky about his dry food. Um, so I've... We're learning. We're learning. And he's got a vet appointment in two weeks. And I'll know so much. I'll know so much about... Uh, s'mores in that vet appointment so i'll get really good at advice at that point because like if i went into the vet right now i wouldn't know what to say because i i don't know s'mores well enough but he is he's doing good i mean he's he's holding in his food for like three or four hours um and holding in his pee for like two hours so i think he's his body's got plenty of time to absorb a healthy amount of nutrients um, yeah, it might not be ideal, but I'm prioritizing the amount of food he eats over, over his poops right now. And we're, tr we're trying to solve that with a supplement and that way he'll get the best of both worlds. So we'll see how he does. Um, he really enjoyed the peanut butter. So took me a while before I realized we're talking about the pet video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of my friends warned me that you would become comfortable with all of all of their health things, and that's totally the case. Like, I just, I can't, I like, none of it bothers me. What's the supplement? I forget what it's called. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I forget, but it's peanut butter flavored, and it has, like, four or five things to help. Uh, I think it's mainly for gland issues, um, but it's got a lot of fiber in it too, and it's peanut butter flavored, and he loves it. So it was my first time giving him something peanut butter flavored, and he woofed it down. So that is good to know, because I'm learning what flavors he likes. <sighs> hey, Geek Up Work, how's it going? So yeah, sorry if I'm talking in a weird or a soft voice, because I uh, talked to s'mores for probably four or five hours a day and i sing him to sleep we do a lot we do a lot of stuff so um but yeah we'll see my uh my breeder recommended sprinkling sp sprinkling some like powder powdered fiber over his food and that's something that we'll try next i want to try these little chews because it's just less work like, it's less work for me, it's less work for him as long as he likes the flavor. Because I can just pick up a quarter of these chews and just give him one and he just woofs it down. So I don't have to worry about him picking around food or learning that he doesn't like the flavor of his food. Because eventually I'll have to be able to take these things away if he's doing good. And I don't want him to become accustomed to that as a routine. So, I've never met a dog that doesn't like peanut butter, yeah. Okay, so chat, today we're going to be working on uh, uh, basically porting my OS's threading model to Linux. So this will help when I want to do like rapid prototyping. Honestly, I haven't written a kernel in like two years, so I don't want to use any of my OS's because they all suck. And I haven't written a kernel in two years because I don't want to write a kernel in Rust anymore. I want to write my next kernel in, um, in Slang. And S Lang is probably a year or two out. So Torvald just wrote one in the last thirty years. Yeah. Yeah, he's a little lazy, isn't he? He's spending too much time gossiping on uh on, <laughs> on email chains. <laughs> okay. So what we're gonna be experimenting with is um basically having uh is my mic clipping let me turn that down a bit and yes s lang is now s'mores lang yeah i think i was clipping i'm turning down my gain a little bit and hopefully that helps if that's too quiet let me know at least obs was saying i'm clipping but obs's clipping indicator is random <laughs> so i don't hear clipping okay i thought s lang is a meme no no, it's not. It's, uh, 
I've already started working on kind of the, like, end curses uh, windowing system that I'll use for the IDE. Obviously, it's going to be trash because I'm writing it in Rust. I, I need to write enough of the language in some proof of concept way and write pieces of the language that I'm comfortable supporting forever so I can start porting the language to itself and start self-hosting. So, why no Rust anymore? Um, Rust, really, my issues are more with LLVM than Rust. Don't get me wrong, Rust is a lot of the problem there in emitting extremely verbose IL to LLVM. And Rust basically has a lot of knowledge about typing and sizes of things and accessing and, and hierarchy and lifetimes and just all that sort of stuff. And it kind of just blasts that all down to LLVM. So LLVM has to like reason about it from the other other direction from the bottom instead of from the top down from the bottom up and try and optimize out like your loops and your length checks and all sorts of stuff and it just does a really bad job at it and I think I can do better so uh, that's slang slang is meant to be my language for high performance development and I want to address a lot of issues that I've had with C and rust when it comes to expressibility and code duplication, and inlining, and constant propagation, and just a lot of things related to performance. Um, I don't know. I think if I really put my head down, I think in six months, I could probably have a language that is good enough for me to write my next OS in, and then I can start really targeting the language against that OS and whatever memory models I decide using. So it can be like hyper aware of that. So. Yeah. Rust is becoming more and more usable. Time for something new and unusable again. Exactly. The libgcc backend is kind of bad right now. I suspect the libgcc background will be bad forever. Right, and uh, the reason for that is, at least right now, I don't know if it's a temporary measure, but the GCC backend to Rust, uh, and keep in mind, I'm talking about the backend, not the Rust GCC like rewrite of the Rust implementation. So the GCC um, backend uses the GCC JIT uh, GCC like JIT API, which is meant for JITs. And let's be honest, JITs have terrible code gen because they need to. They're designed for quick compilation, making code snippets that will run for like a bunch of loops and then be discarded. They're not meant for uh, like permanent compilation. They just aren't, they don't go deep enough. They don't go wide enough to do those things. So I'm not, I'm not upset with that. It's, I think that backend is more about uh, getting a little bit of redundancy and experimenting with that. I don't know if they have long-term plans for like full GCC integration. I can't imagine they would because GCC is not something to be worked with internally at that level. So we don't see you for months and you come back with I3. No, this is uh this is Sway. Oh here, let me put this down a bit so you can see the time. There we go. There we go. Now you have access to the clock. Um, are there attempts to get more high-level info into LLVM? I imagine, like, that's probably a constant, constant thing at all times. Maybe you just want a new backend. Um, I don't think so, because the, basically, the information that's provided by Rust is already kind of shit, IMO, right? Like, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, it's better than pretty much anything out there, but it's not great. I'm still using X11 with AWM. Is that a typo or do you mean DWM? Um, I've never heard of... Oh, do you mean Awesome? Awesome Window Manager? That's actually what I used before DWM back in high school. I would have been using that on... Uh, something light, something site. Foresight Linux? Foresight Linux was the Linux that I was using back in high school because it was the only one 
that out of the box without configuration worked with my USB webcam. And to me, that was really cool because I don't think I got it working in any other environment. So I was a Foresight user, or whatever the fuck that was. And I think that's when I switched to Awesome. In fact, if we were to look at my old um, video, let's see. Uh, oh, I didn't pick good window numbers. This is one issue I don't like with Sway. With multi-monitors, it kind of sucks. Okay. LVM is so big and bloated that sometimes it's hard to understand what it's doing or why it's doing things. Yeah. My view is that it's it does a, a bad job of... Here. Uh, let's see if I... Yeah, I, I think... LVM, I think, trips over itself. I think LVM ends up basically doing optimizations that make other simpler optimizations more difficult. For example, turning like uh, ands or some like ads into some like bitwise math or something due to weird rounding or integer truncation or you know some weird properties you have, and then that ends up turning into it like maybe it has a constant propagation pass or some pass that can handle the ads, but it can't handle the new semantics that are technically theoretically faster, but now they're not getting removed where if they stayed as ads, they'd get removed. But since they're not ads, they get stuck because it LVM optimizes it into something that is more difficult to analyze with another pass. Um, and that's a really common issue I see in LVM, and I plan to address that in my language by having the code on one side and the real-time, like, IL, ideally, like, the optimized version of the high-level code in real-time, so that I get a good sense of what does and doesn't work. If there's things that I see bad code gen from my... When I'm typing my code, if I see that bad code gen, which I'll be seeing in real time, so I'll constantly be checking it, aka debugging it, um, basically uh, in that environment, when I, um, when I run into an issue with bad code gen, I'll sit down and I'll think through, like, is this something that I can solve with a pass? Is this something that compilers are good at optimizing? And if so, yes, imp implement that optimization pass. But if this is genuinely just a hard thing for compilers, then I will go and ask myself, is this something that at the high level language, I can try a different paradigm? Can I use a bump allocator? Can I skip using an atomic? Can I, can I switch to something that turns it from a hard optimization problem from the compiler to an easy one? And the goal will be to implement these simple optimization passes that compilers are good at rather than like NP hard optimizations that they have to guess at and have like thresholds where they give up. I want to have optimizations that run to a, a deeper level of completion. And to do that, I need things that are algorithmically much simpler to implement. And I, I genuinely think that it's possible to write a language that can express things to a compiler in very easy ways, whether that's through the type system, whether that's through annotations of access patterns of the variables, whether they're read-only, read-write, write-only, all sorts of things there, whether they're used only in one thread, whether they're ever passed into a thread, if they go into a closure, like all of this stuff is information that I can very, very heavily leverage in an optimizer. Um, and really what I want to do is I want to build an optimizer and then design a language around that optimizer, right? Does the S and S slang stand for s'mores? It had no specific meaning before, but now it does. It is now s'mores slang. And you don't need to do much to get 70% of perf of LLVM. Yeah, I think I'll immediately be slaughtering LLVM's perf because I'll be able to const prop 10 functions deep where LVM struggles to const prop one closure deep. Um, what do you mean by simpler algorithms? Mainly algorithms that can be uh, passed in like one or two forwards or backwards passes. So like really, really light passes. Ones that 
can work mainly with linear passes where like you're not block aware you're not traversing a graph because the second you're traversing a graph it's going to be really slow right because graphs are pointer chasing and now you're basically paying a dependent random load cost every single edge right and i want to have passes where i can just treat the entire function or block or whatever as just a linear slice of code and that means that some optimizations i can't do across uh like graph boundaries but it means that i can do things like emulation and constant propagation much more aggressively so um really what i want to do is take some of the optimizations that I've been writing for the most recent vectorized emulation and build a language around them because genuinely, I mean, I make, I make the code that I fuzz probably 10 times faster to run. Now, don't get me wrong. Most code out there has a lot of dead code and is shit. Um, the code I write hopefully won't have that big of an advantage, but the deeper constant propagation runs, the the more complex abstractions that I can implement in the language and be confident that those abstractions will get deleted. Because uh, Rust has the whole like zero cost abstraction thing. And don't get me wrong, those zero cost abstractions are, are sick and awesome and a very valuable part of the language in my heart. But LVM chokes on those. LLVM sees a lot of this stuff, unless they get optimized out at the Rust level, obviously. But if those things like bounds checks, length checks, overflow checks, uh, loop unrolling, inlining, um, constant propagation, detection of, of things that can never change, propagation of pointers, structure layouts, all those sorts of things, um, LLVM sucks at them. So Rust is designed to have like these zero cost abstractions that can be optimized out and usually they can in a in a test example but then when you add another variable to the equation basically another dimension that the optimizer has to handle which is what happens when you go further and further from the root right let's say the root is an array access that has a bounds check okay well you go one function out and the optimizer might have a threshold of number of functions or number of depth and now it no longer sees that length is constant and can't handle it right there's there's so much stuff here um semantically you'd be able to still do a depth first search but the optimizer would make the accesses less pointer chasing yes optimizing zero cost abstractions is tricky yep more like zero cost in theory exactly so I think, I think basically all of the things that Rust strives to make zero cost can be made zero cost when the optimizer is aware of the language. Because keep in mind, once again, I'm not shitting on LVM. LVM at the end of the day is first and foremost a C++ optimizer. And C++ doesn't use like no alias much right and because of that we've seen how many times rust had to turn on and off lvm aliasing optimizations because they were just wrong and once the wrong parts are fixed then we have to work on making them good and how good will they ever get when ultimately it's still designed for c plus plus and not even c plus plus theoretically but c plus plus in the ways that billions of lines of code that already exist use C++. And a lot of those paradigms, a lot of the recursive programming, aggressive allocations, use of global variables, um, are just terrible for optimization. So you're going to have an optimizer, LLVM, that has to work well in those environments. And I can make a language that forbids globals entirely. And bam, now I don't have to worry about even checking for those edge cases in the fast paths of my code, let alone have them at all. You know, that's that's kind of what I'm talking about there. So, yeah, it's, it's fine. It's not a, a shit on LVM. It's more than I'm making a language for me, for my, for my code, for my optimized, uh, optimizer for my IDE for my environment like I plan on writing an IDE because I plan on having attributes and 
annotations that are more verbose than would be comfortable to program in. So I want to make it so those are things that you can hide or make it more interactive like an Ida or a Ghidra experience where you can like right click a function or highlight a function and open a dialogue or not a dialogue. I hate dialogues. I, I don't like any pop-ups ever. Please only only ever have like a, a side window. I plan on having like a mode that it switches into. But I want to be able to edit things kind of in the background and seamlessly. And I don't need to support a bunch of IDEs. I don't need to have a, a grammatically complete textual representation. So, which means that I don't need things like quotes and parentheses and curly braces because those can be handled in the expression editor. So, like, I plan on having it where... Um, if anyone here has ever used an HP 50G uh, calculator, they have an expression editor where you can kind of like arrow around to select different parts of the expression. And then you can hit two other buttons to like zoom out to like select more encapsulating expressions that are higher and higher out. Um, I want to have something like that where I can arrow out or zoom out where I'm selecting like the block, the function, the file, that sort of thing. Well, files won't exist in my language. But, and then zoom down where I go like into an expression where it's highlighting the expression, then highlighting a, a subcomponent of the expression, then going in deeper and highlighting a, just a single um, constant or something in that expression. And that'll allow me to have strings without quotes where I'll have quotes visibly, but I don't have to like think about processing quotes and escaping quotes and that sort of shit. Because the IDE will just be aware that it's a string. Um, and I'm thinking about having an expression editor. I plan on having like Vim-like bindings where um, you'll be able to like highlight an expression and you'll be able to like hit the edit key and you'll be able to edit the expression using like a normal like C, C++ expression syntax. But I also want to be able to have another edit key that edits it in RPN so that I can, or like, create a new expression. So when I edit an expression, I normally want the bracketized version, but when I'm creating a new expression, it'd be nice to be able to say, hit my key, that is, create a new uh, RPN expression at this cursor location, and then I can just type in an RPN sequence. I don't have to worry about getting parens and, and orders of operations correct. Hit enter, and then that goes into the AST, and then I can visualize that AST however I find most convenient to visualize. Or I could even have an alternative, um, like, syntax, because you'll be editing the AST. So in theory, there could be different ways to look at the language. There could be different syntaxes and, and visualizations for, for different modes of operation. So I don't know. So, yeah. This is you back on Twitch. Yeah, I'm streaming on all the streaming things now. Okay, let me catch up on chat. But yeah, that's S-Lang. That's why I'm passionate about it. Thanks for gifting a sub to Trump for New Zealand. Okay. I didn't know Trump was, uh, was moving to New Zealand, but if he does, uh, good luck. <laughs> Um, do you think Zig is too C-brained? Um, I haven't used Zig. I can't speak to it. I'm sorry. How can you forbid globals when there are things like memory mapped uh, peripherals? That will have to be like a very, very special case thing. Um, obviously that will be to the compiler like a, a memory barrier where you'll have to access, access it through some wrapper that knows that when you go into the wrapper that needs to start a barrier. That's something that I wish Rust had. Obviously, you can express it in Rust, but a way to express barriers as basically deref wrappers, uh, once again, obviously, you can express that in Rust. Make your own library and do that. Um, but I think it would be really cool where you say, like, you have a thing, and to access that thing, you need to do a barrier first. And you can kind of express more about the semantics of your intentions of threading and passing of the variable between threads at more of a granularity. Like, Rust doesn't even have that. Rust has send and sync, which is, like, 
allow this to be sent or shared between threads. But Rust doesn't have the the notion of like what your intent is. Um, I'd like to be able to say like, hey, in this function, I'm going to pass this to another thread. And that would be an annotation on the thread function. The thread function would see that the closure is capturing that variable. So it would annotate in the type system, hey, the type system has detected that this is passed into a thread, which goes into the function annotation, which goes to the call sites. The call sites can then think about whether or not they should, you know, batch stuff in certain ways to, to make that faster. There's there's so many things. Um, I don't know. It's something I really want to experiment with. Uh, like everything else, I'll probably write it once, realize that there's some things I don't like pathing on, and I'll just go and redo it. So... Super curious how that language will turn out. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm super excited. The real-time control flow graph seems interesting to me. I've been looking for something like that where you can see what uh, each line you add outputted. Yeah. yeah. And part of that is going to be required that the language is syntactically valid at all times, um, which is, like, kind of tough. Um, but that's why I really want to edit the AST where it will... Compilation errors will be more like a question mark in an expression or a highlighted expression that's like, this expression isn't valid yet. Um, but once you update that, I, I want it so... Um, and to assist in this, I plan on having ways to comment stuff out very easily. Um, and I want to be able to implement smart comments as well. So like Rust... If you comment something out, it's going to start now complaining things are unused. You're going to get a bunch of warnings, and maybe you'll miss a warning that's important. I want to have, like, a, a special comment. Keep in mind, it will be, like, highlight an expression or a, 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 a block and hit some hotkey. And that will be an expression that's, like, basically treat this code as still existing, but ignore the syntax error. Basically allow it to reference expressions and functions and stuff. So you're like, basically the the way that I do this in Rust is you put it around an if false, right? And the if false um, means that like, you the code still has to be valid, but you're able to basically comment something out like performance wise or for some other reasons while not getting unused variables for all the stuff that you only use in that block. So, I saw a really interesting talk um, about designing a native AST editor. Lots of interesting editing and viewing codes. Oh, interesting. The how and why of reinventing the wheel. That probably sounds really fun. Um... <laughs> False comment, yeah. Yep, a dedicated syntax just sounds more proper. I would like that to also be uh, smart in that there are some syntax errors. There are some syntax errors that can be ignored, in my opinion. Or some errors that can be ignored. So I guess my language won't have syntax errors, but it will have like references to variables that no longer exist, that sort of thing. Those, I should be able to safely comment that out. Yes, I can't compile that, but I should be able to comment it out in the, like, silent comment because there will be a subset of things that only affect the, the, the block that it's in or the chunk of code that's commented out, in which case those errors can be ignored um, I don't know. There's, there's really weird stuff that I really want to experiment with. Um, and really, uh, the way I describe this in my head is like, this is how I think about and, and like visualize a lot of stuff these days. Um, which is you're really like, you're fitting a function. Um, and let's say it, if you have, oh wow, that's terrible. Okay. Um, if you have something like C++, 
right? You have like all these pits all over the place in the code, right? So like, let's say this is conceptually the code. So the optimizer, and let's do the optimizer in this color. Uh, the optimizer to do well needs to be able to like fit these, right? To fit these deeper and deeper and deeper and, you know, and whatever. And making the, the optimizer better means that, you know, you you handle this case a little bit better. And then this is the same, and this is the same, and this is the same, right? These are basically things the optimizer understands about stuff that you're doing in your code. Does this make any sense? Um, but what I want to do is design technicality pits within pits, yeah. What I want to do is design a language more like this, right? Where there's some more hurdles to the language itself so that it's designed to fit into things that the optimizer already can just do better optimizing, right? And this is not like, this is not like code. This is just more concepts, right? Where like, let's say the concept of, of this well is like uh, array access with bounds check, right? So like, that's like what that pit is. So it's more like a conceptual thing. I like how I'm moving the whole thing. Um, and this one's some, like a loop unroll, and this one's something else. And I, I want to eliminate things that are hard to handle and things that add these barriers. Because the way I like to describe it, now we're going to talk about this as if it is a linear thing, <laughs> which makes no sense. Uh, so yeah, I'm making this really confusing for you guys. Get fucked. Um, the thing is, like, these areas... Why can't I draw? Oh, because I have that selected. So like these areas that the compiler cannot reason about are barriers that can no longer be crossed, right? So let's say this is an array axis with a bounds check. And then this is like, I don't know, some like a double deref, right? So we'll say that this is a, a double deref and the, the optimizer is bad at double derefs. And then here we have like math. Right, and this is just raw constant math. Well, the thing is, this math has to operate from memory because the com and the bounds check is probably going to have to go back in because the optimizer cannot pass information across this boundary. Right, once you have written code in a way or that's deep enough that you've hit some threshold or some barrier that the, the optimizer can no longer view past it because maybe the expression is not something that symbolically it can represent or maybe it's an unhandled case or maybe it's a bug that it can't propagate some certain code because it, it literally has a bug that's preventing it from optimizing a certain way. That barrier now means that like this must exist fully independent of this this must flush entirely into memory. This must come all the way back out from memory, right? Because, because this math and the source of the operations we're, we're mathing on are not things, they're, they're blocked by some operation or some level of depth or some level of abstraction that the optimizer doesn't understand or or blows up an expression or is literally like if this case stop processing to prevent recursion or something like that right then these are now separate and the optimizations are disabled and since this is a memory barrier now you have a memory barrier on all code so you have this like choke point where you have like this is cached in a register this is cached in a, a like you have this variable in a register, this variable in a register, this variable in a register, and let's say you have this variable that's written to memory that the compiler knows can't be accessed by another thread yet and thus can assume that you have exclusive access. The second you go into one of these choke points, all of these must get flushed to memory. So the regs get spilled out of regs, go back into their homes, and then you have memory, and now when you go and access these things again on the other side, you have to fetch them back from memory into registers. And memory for something like LLVM 
memory is basically global. So to an optimizer like LVM, once things get flushed out to memory in these choke points, everything has to be assumed volatile. So you have to now refill in your loop ii counter. You have to refill in the argument that got passed in. You have to refill in something that you just wrote to just wrote to memory in this function. And that also means that optimizations basically don't work here because nearly every single variable that gets flushed to memory and back out of memory is treated as fully unconstrained, right? Because the optimizer has to assume that a volatile memory axis that it can't optimize through, that it can't see both sides of that access, has to be fully volatile. So effectively, the second you hit one thing that the compiler choke the optimizer like chokes on or can't express, it's over because now everything must be flushed and now all the other optimizations are dead because they're getting sourced from memory, right? Now, obviously, we can get rid of these choke points a lot in local local locations in optimizers like LVM, but they really struggle to go a function or two deep or through a closure or across other things. So I really want to basically support a lot more parallelism of... Uh, like memory region access permissions. And to do this, I need an extremely strong memory model where effectively these choke points will mainly be like, this is a thread passing thing where it's like it goes into a thread sync. And even then it could know that it's maybe only passing it in. So it needs to flush, but it doesn't need to restore because maybe it will know that that thread uh doesn't write to those variables it only reads from them and thus we can keep those you know in that location there's there's so much stuff that we can do so okay yeah i don't know oh thank you for the raid sephiraphoria sephiraphoria Thank you so much for the raid. What are you working on? So, given s'mores is... Oh, he laid back down. Okay. Um, s'mores on the go. He laid back down. But yeah, he he did he did peek his head up. He will he will do that. I've maybe said something loud. Um, as long as he sets his head back down, to me, I've been using that as as a sign that he doesn't have to really go. Um. And I don't want to take him out too often. I want him to get used to the the pressure that he's like holding in. So basically, if he ever looks up at me and then lays back down or looks comfortable, I'm gonna assume he doesn't urgently have to go. Um, but if he gets up now, which I think he's going to, maybe not. <laughs> He hears me. He's attentive to me right now. I have some bells coming that I'm going to put on the door for him to ring. Uh, and I'll teach him that that's go outside. How old is he? He is nine weeks old. LVM tries to see memory accesses with Memdereg. Um, doesn't work plenty of times, though. Yeah, exactly. Another way is just bringing your source code closer to the optimized output. Uh, yeah, so that the things that compiler actually optimizes are less wasteful, yeah. And with an AST editor, hopefully I'll be able to keep a lot of optimization information in cache so that I only have to compile the, like, local stuff. And I can have compiled runnable output immediately. Oh. <laughs> okay, he just wanted a cold spot. He probably got that spot too warm. <laughs> If I go and, like, touch that spot, it will be hot <laughs> on the ground. Okay. Um, let me catch up on chats. <laughs> Honestly, chats are, like, so active today that it's hard to keep up. I'm sorry. I'll try. I know I'm going on my S-Lang rant. Um, he's so cute. Yeah. Get those sound buttons. I don't like the sound buttons. I don't know why. Maybe it's because they're, like, too humanizing. 
um, I'm trying to keep it a little more analog. I don't know. Something about something about the buttons feels like maybe it lacks personality. I think is maybe what bothers me is there's not as much um, personality there. Like I, I I want him to have his way that he likes to ring his bells and the aggressiveness he goes at. You know, there's just little things like that. I don't know. Maybe I just hate tech. Um, don't get me wrong. The sound buttons are cool. It's just not something that I seem to like for some reason. Um, uh, are you going to target X86 and ARM? Um, I'm going to target everything, of course. So, um, basically, I, it's going to be so easy to backend it because I plan on having, like, move fuscator passes where I can basically translate the language into, like, some extremely bastardized only adds, only reads, only writes, and, like, an if statement. Basically, some Turing complete combination of shit. So that will allow me to ram the aisle through that, and then, like, when we were working on the oscilloscope firmware and found out that it was Blackfin, and that Rust didn't comment Black... or, uh, target Blackfin, or LVM doesn't target Blackfin, and we just gave up on that project. I want that to not be a blocker. I want it to be where I can just go and in literally 15 minutes, implement the 10 instructions in my assembler um, in some naive way. Obviously, we're not going to get good code gen, but we'll get code gen, which means I can use the code that I like, that I've written, that I've designed, that's good, that I know will produce good code once I implement stuff like that. So, are you going to only target bare metal or also Windows or Linux? Um, I actually have an interesting plan for that in Nikito Nikito you you just won okay you just won I'm trying to gift you a sub I'm getting I'm getting to it I'm, I'm trying I'm slow I'm slow okay Oh, I just gifted a sub to a random person. Sorry. Um, well, there you go. Uh, that's the gifted sub. You don't get it, Nikito. Get fucked. Um, okay. So, <laughs> uh, Nikito, the reason that he's really smart and good and handsome is that he segued into today's stream. And today's stream is actually a perfect example of why... Um, the, what we're writing today is exactly what I plan to do for S-Line. And basically what I, what I plan on doing is instead of producing an elf or doing something like that, what I'm going to do is if you've ever used a bin format on Linux, it's a way that you can basically tell the kernel uh, about other executable files. So you have to tell it about... It, it's like a really simple format of telling it basically like what the header of the file is so the kernel can detect if it's runnable on your system. And if it is, then it can pass that to another program. So like Kimu uses this so you can dot slash run an ARM program and it will just run because bin format will tell the kernel to actually wrap it in a Kimu call. So I plan on doing that for my language, where I write a bin format thing, and then I plan on having my own runtime where I get execution from under start. So basically like CRT zero, and I will set up my environment. And I think my environment, Linux should be basically the same speed as my OS, except for preemption and anything related to syscalls. Obviously syscalls will still be slow, but my plan will be to set up a memory model that does so few syscalls that it won't matter, which is what I do in my OS anyways, right? I, um, and one of the big things, and that's what we get to work on today. Thanks, Nikito, for tying this all back together. What I want to work on today is, um, basically seeing what models work well in Linux 
And one of the models that I really want to try is what about using processes for threads where basically shared memory is the special case rather than in, in threads, basically everything is assumed to be shared memory in those threads. But I want to go the other way. I want to make it so memory by default is single threaded only, aka globals in the language are now safe to read and write to because they are are truly exclusive to their to their threads. So basically you can now use like ref cells in a global. You don't have to use a mutex, right? Stuff like that. Um and uh because of that um you should get way better memory management. Really, here's what I'm trying to avoid today, and I'm trying to benchmark. I'm trying to see if there's ways that I can avoid the virtual memory address space lock on the entire process by using multiple processes with shared memory. So, one of the downsides of shared memory between processes is extra TLB pressure. Yes, exactly. So what I want is I want cache lines to be in the exclusive state or in the shared state. So we'll do copy on write for all the shared memory. And this is why I want to make a bin format thing because I'm going to write a custom format that has a custom loader and can express what memory belongs to like what threads and processes, right? Um, which is really interesting. <laughs> Isn't that just thread local? It's not because thread locals require going through kind of an unknown pointer, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to experiment with that. So we're going to determine, is this a good path? So to do that, we're going to write some artificial benchmarks to kind of stress these different modes and see how they behave. If it works exactly as we expect, which it probably will, then we're going to go and start working on my threading model, which will effectively be a loader. And what I'm going to do is build a runtime. Oh my God, is he running in his sleep? Is he running? Oh my God. <laughs> What's the name? His name is S'mores. <laughs> so each thread gets its own page table. Yes, exactly. And that's how I do it in my own OS. In my own OS, there aren't threads. There are cores. And you have to delegate those tasks to those cores. You don't get to create new threads. You don't get to delete existing threads. And because of that, I can start hard coding more things like page tables and whatever. And I plan on doing the same thing here. So the runtime will take basically one argument, which is the number of permanent threads to spin up. And then as time goes on, I'll design more and more data structures that are designed for this threading model that can handle it, like queues and task structures and basically like async style stuff, but it won't be able to use async. Um, I don't want to use async anyways because it's, once again, an abstraction that's really hard to optimize around. So, yeah. Have you seen John Blow's language, Jai? I have. He talked about something similar where you can do some clever comp compiler optimization. Um, yes, I, I agree. I, like, I think this is just the direction that we're going to be seeing. I think there's a reason that there's a decent amount of us experimenting with that. I'm obviously not a compiler person, so it's not an area of expertise of mine. Um, but I have a tendency of working on projects that end up being like really big deals in like three or four years. Not, not I write a project that becomes a big deal, but I work on something before the public really gets into the concepts of it. And they're not learning from me. It's parallel. Like people are discovering these things at the same time. That, that's just how things work. You know, standing on the shoulders of giants, 
So a lot of us are standing in the same locations and viewing the same, the same hills. Simultaneous discovery, yeah. When he's sleeping, is he snores? <laughs> Isn't the carpet more comfortable? No, he likes the hard, cold floor. I think just... I think he likes the thermal mass. I am seriously considering buying him like a... <laughs> like a thousand dollar piece of aluminum. Just like a, a solid block of aluminum that's like two inches thick and like the size of the area he's laying on and just have that be his bed. <laughs> Imagine the thermal conductivity. <laughs> and then I could put like a heat sink or a radiator on the other side and get him to um like, oh, massive cast iron pan. Yeah, I should give it some walls. I should fabricate like a, a a billet aluminum little area where he can lay in with some like walls he can like lean up against. In floor air conditioning. Yeah. Um Running your first uh let's see. Running your first OS on a low power device like a Pi. I'm gonna run my stuff on um on my hardware, which is a uh, 192 thread, 768 gig RAM, I have two servers with that. So they're uh, four, uh, technically eight memory nodes, but uh, four physical processors. And then since I have two servers, I can experiment with networking. So I want my software to scale all the way up transparently through the network. So the data structures will be... OS threading model memory model aware so that they'll leverage the local memory as much as possible and then when necessary things will get routed over the network uh, in batches or bulk um, so I plan to basically making all those things tunable the granularities like basically generic so like when you make a hash map you will express um, whether or not you expect it to be distributed over systems and if you do do you want it to be real-time sync? Do you need it to be atomic where it's in lockstep? Do you need it or like sequentially consistent effectively? Do you, is it a push only thing where you just need to push to a, a global database? So you need to tell something about rights. Uh, and basically all of those will be generics in the language. So I plan on having extremely aggressive generic support so you can have heavily tunable data structures because that's that's how life is right like i i don't really ever want to use dynamically sized structures because i want to be able to optimize out more array length checks now if rust had a better way of doing uh basically indicating that like on creation of a vector the length becomes constant that would be fucking fantastic but it doesn't have a good way of seeing that and knowing that none of the operations that you perform will ever expand it. They're starting to add those. Once again, this is the issue with Rust. Rust is now adding the, like, push if there's capacity functions. But first of all, Rust has to add all of these things. Then they have to add annotations for these and then tell LVM about these for you to actually benefit from them. And it also means that you have to change your code to use them. So now you can't use the same code for your local implementation and your remote implementation and your threaded implementation. I want to be able to write one data structure and be like, use these synchronization primitives for local single threaded access and use these for across uh, things on your same NUMA node and use these primitives for between NUMA nodes and use these for over the network without having to rewrite the fucking code a million times because it sucks. <laughs> so atomics over the network sounds slow um atomics over the network actually exists with uh infiniband and like high-end um rdma those atomics are handled actually by the nic uh through shared memory so yeah yeah fuck yeah that's what we're gonna be using <laughs> like there's a good chance that this will be like one of the one of the dankest OSs out there. <laughs>
So, thanks for your fuzzing with Emus Repo. Currently working on a Risk Five emulator in C for fuzzing. Really fun project. That's awesome. That sounds like a really good way of doing it. Why do most OSs use only 64 co cores? Um, oh yeah, because a lot of data structures have, you know, they use a, a pointer width to store a bitmap, or they have worse performance because larger than a, a U size is a special case, so they go into like some slow backups model. Or like Linux, I think just has that as a default in def config. So um, Linux, you have to like do the kernel config to change that or run a distribution that's changed that because I think the default config has that. And that's probably, I would imagine, because C or any OS is reasonably going to have a fixed size static global table that is indexed by your thread ID. And that's going to be kind of like the root way of, of accessing thread specific things obviously using things like gs is more common now but historically you kind of had to do things based on your thread id and globals and constant size tables because once again for optimization reasons dynamic size things are terrible and if you want to avoid dynamic size things then you need static size things and to do static size things you need to pick a static size and you can either do something really big and waste a lot of memory that will never be used, or you can do something small and have the Linux issue where, like, Linux won't even recognize the cores, or you can find a way, like, in my case, in my language, I plan on plumbing all those up as const generics. So you'll pick the number of threads that are going to access it, the access patterns that you plan on having, like... The size, the cache sizes, the whether or not you want the entries to be cache lined aligned or if you want them on, uh, compressed as much as possible for size. There's a lot of cool things. So that sounds pretty cool. I've done something similar with a high-speed uh, high array vector that has an optional B-tree database for seamless persistent data. It allows me to use the same data structures and interfaces for game code while option optionally saying that some uh, variable sets can be memory mapped to disk for writes. Reads always taking place directly from mem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, having stuff like that is really cool. Um, and I want to be able to express those things way better at, at the programming language because checking whether or not you have that mode enabled costs stuff. And that cost, even if it's a single if statement, that could be the if statement that the optimizer can no longer look past, right? Which is not the case in the very local zone, but it is the case when the optimizer is already eight functions up in inlining and const propagation and it encounters this other if statement. So what I really want is that I can easily turn on and off things like that at the instance level, where basically based on how I created an instance, I'll get different code, and the language will know which interfaces to dispatch to, because obviously vtables are also terrible for performance, so I'm not going to do it through dynamic programming, which is how most people do shit like this, which is terrible. Um, okay. Let's see. All in Rust, yeah. See, that is the thing about Rust and why I like it so much. Rust allows me to express way more information to the compiler through lifetimes um, than a language like C or C++. So in theory, Rust actually does some way better code gen. And actually, in practice, it does way better code gen because I can genericize these things way better. Now, obviously, C and C++ have better const experts. And so you can use const expert like booleans for turning things on and off. But it's still things with lifetimes allow me to tie things to instances um, and make a lot of these things become like automatically typed. There's just a lot of stuff. Jesus, do you work in infra? No, no, I don't. I don't actually develop for a living. I, I haven't only like the first year out of high school for me did I have a development job. I've never done professional uh, programming. I don't really know how. 
Um, when you download the executable, you should be able to pick the size granularity that fits your hardware. Yeah. Yep. So. Okay. So, uh, let's do some experiments. We're going to experiment um, with the performance differences of um, MMAP in a single process and MMAP in a uh, in threads. How does that sound? Oh, do I have Linux running on um, Oh, do I still have my Let's see if we uh still have my chat. We're gonna set up a dev environment in Linux with a custom in it. Okay, like we did last time. Remember when we developed that custom in it? I'm gonna see where I wrote that. Okay, I wrote it on my old machine, but hopefully this is still gonna boot. Okay. Um github.com Mozilla Labs. I think in it. Um, and this is what we're going to try. So this is my custom Linux in it thing. And what we're going to see is... Um, were we pixie booting this? So we should be able to make it. Um, uh, why is that user home dirty? Why is that not user home tea? That's weird. Um, let's uh, change the type. And then, uh, let's There we go. Uh, and let's do a Rust update as well. You remember that one guy that did the Terraria 32-bit CPU? Uh, I think I've seen that, but I haven't... Um, I haven't... Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, I haven't... I, I like see it, saw it pop up, but I'm not familiar with what he did or what his implementation was. Okay. Oh, fuck you. Um, do I have Kimu? Yes. So this will run in a test OS. <sighs> okay, let's figure out this problem. Are you getting into Tibia servers? Yeah, I, I just run a local Tibia server for fun, for solo play. What? Why don't I have permissions? Uh Why can't I why can't I change these permissions? Oh, I was on the wrong fucking computer. <laughs> I was association to the wrong box. Whoopsie doodles. Whoopsies. <laughs> uh, we're a very smart chat. Uh, okay.
Okay. We're very smart. Classic. Tibia was my first online game. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, there was just a server that came out, uh, Shade Cores, that I played on a little bit, but with my puppy and some travel, uh, I fell behind in levels, and now I have lost my interest in playing. Um, especially the server is broken down in war. Honestly, I kind of enjoy Tibia single player more. Okay. Copy. Debug. Oops. In it. Yep. Um. I forget how this shit works. Uh. Oh, boot. Oh, that feeling when you've never cleaned your project. Uh, clean. Okay. So disk requires boot, boot requires make der p boot sbin. Actually needs boot sbin. Okay, and let's see. I've never run uh, Kimu on this, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see what we need permissions to do here. Okay. Oh, and then I'm gonna just copy this from my other server. Uh, SCP Gamey init Linux. I really don't want to, uh, oh, fuck me. Okay. What distro is this? This is Gen 2. I see an NPM folder and a yarn folder. <gasps> Monkas. Don't. Why are you peeking around my shit? Ah. Yarn, oh no. I don't know. I feel like this is going fast enough that I'm not going to tar it up. It's doing a great job. Oh, those must be some big files. Are you multi-streaming? Yes. I'm streaming on YouTube and on my custom streaming site. If you want to uh, watch directly on the on the real stream, rsync would already be finished. Yeah. YouTube. Your JIT series inspired me to build a full system risk 5 uh, 64 emulator. That's awesome. What uh, what ISA extensions do you add support for? I am enjoying setting up my uh, new uh, new Linux system. Video codec is not happy. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be real mad. Our clone? What's our clone? Uh. Oh, well, it's done. What is our clone? What what support does it have? Can that do parallel transfers? Does it require a, a new custom server? Okay, let's see.
Risk fee I iMac FD. Oh, so you did basically full support for everything. Okay. Uh what's the uh what's the escape for Kimi again? Uh AX, there we go. Uh, kernel, BZ image, append that, dev SDA1. Oh, do I have to compress that myself? What do I give? So BZ image, append, dev SDA1, a raw file, a uh, raw thing. Vert IO forwarding, no reboot, no graphic. Why, why am I not seeing it boot? Anyone know? Come on. Now it won't even get axed. Why can't I kill that? What the hell? Uh... Weird. KVM BZ image. Uh, a pen. No graphic, no reboot. Huh. Yo, does it not realize that's a comment? Is that really that hard for that to process? Um, let's get rid of the Nick. Who does that? Oh, that RW boot. Uh, no, it should be able to handle it. Get rid of this. What is going on with my keyboard? Or Vim, or what? Oh, I, I know. Here, let's... Oh, Jesus. I was about to say, what the fuck? No graphic, no reboot. Uh, TTYS0, discard the, yeah, that's something I have been starting to do, but I don't think that is the problem. Kernel, KVM, what the fuck? Yeah, just do the bear command, yeah, yeah, you're right. So I saw the blip of the BIOS. Wait, or is it running? Is that running? Uh... Here, one second. I'm gonna make my SE Linux policy for this. Da, da, da. This 
just making some messy Linux policy. Okay. Uh, make. Okay. So hopefully this runs good. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a chance that it's just running. Uh, net stats and grab listen. Run this. Oh, I got rid of that fucking thing. I think I might have built the kernel to be silent. For perf? I don't know. I feel like that's not something I normally would do. Okay, yeah. Now we need to set this up. This is just uh, SE Linux permission. Not a big deal. But we'll see. Um, and then we'll just set this up on a remote server. But I just want to get this working locally first. So we can do some spearmints. Is it running? Uh... Okay. What was I using to run it? Uh... Chad, how did I netcat to this? How did I net get to this? <laughs> I forgot. Um, because I need to send and watch the stream. Yeah, what what did I do? Let me see. Um, uh, 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 I can't remember if I wrote a program for this. S'mores, yeah. He run? Oh, he was running? Oh my god. Okay. Yeah, so we have a program. What's, uh... What's what's the problem? Is it my kernel? Oh, uh, how do we configure this kernel? Boot BZ image. Oh, because this is the kernel built for real hardware. Okay, let's just do real hardware then. Fuck this, right? OK. 
Okay. Um. Okay. Not grizzly. Um Okay, let's uh Power reset. Okay. Um, and then we have to put this on a flash drive. What file system did I use, chat? Did I do VFAT? Set up a new flash drive. Looks like we should be able to just fat format it. So we'll do that. Okay. Uh, That USB port not working? Okay, let's try the other one. Hey! Oh, wrong computer. Um. Okay. Well, that's a big mosquito. Holy shit. A oh, big boy. Uh, what do I need to do here? This. Okay. We got it, chat. Ladies and gentlemen, we got them. Okay, we're going to format this and set it up real quick here. Why not add the config bits for Kimu? Because I, I don't know what it is. Um, um What would Kimu want? I mean, I have SATA. Oh, but only AHCA? AHCI? It should have the serial port, I bet.
How do I go to that? Like, how do I go to this? Driver's TTY serial. It's probably 16550. Yeah, the 8250 should be there. Like, I think I have support for that. Um, Let me see what uh, Colonel... Uh, oh, I know what it is. The boot args, right? Where's the boot args? Unless I don't specify them, but I think I do. Maybe maybe I don't. I'm just I'm just gonna fucking put it on the real server. It's where we gotta test anyways. So I don't really give a shit. Um Make FS fat dev SDA. Block ID. Okay. Okay, I should be able to copy VM Linux to mount mount. And Copy, uh, copy boot s bin in it to mount mount. Okay, VM Linux and in it. That's all I have. And now we'll go uh, flop this over to uh, to um. To Polar. I'll be right back. Oh, I need to use a BZ image. You're right. Thanks. You're right. Totally right. Um. Uh, Linux boots. Uh, oops. Arch. Been a while. Um, there we go. Okay. We're gonna um we're gonna boot into this. There you go. So we'll go right into the shell. Oops. Oh, if he's gonna keep sleeping, I'll keep sleeping. Otherwise I go play with him. 
the title is background music? I have no idea. Oh, maybe it is up. What do we want to give this? Oops. Oops. There we go. There we go. Oh, I think I had to put in that Espen in it. It might still pick up this in it. We'll see. Nice. It found SDA. That's good. I think it does boot in it. S bin in it, I think, is first. Oh, nope. Okay. Ah, shit. All right. We'll put an S bin in it. My bad. That's okay. We'll, uh, we'll go change that directory. Or we could tell it, um, right, in it equals in it. We'll do that. Chassis reset. Uh, oh, power reset. Okay. All right. I'll reboot. Okay. I'm confused why it works and on my host, but not uh, Kimu. I don't really give a shit, to be honest. <laughs> because of EFI? Ah. I'm gonna go take s'mores out. Let me uh, let me get into setup, and I'll uh, we'll go take s'mores out. Bong bong.
<laughs> He's so cute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. The Byzantary image. Then I'll do this, and then I'll do init equals. Should be an absolute path? Sure. Fuck it. I'm sure Linux is smart enough to handle that. Try running your biz image with uh, OVMF. Yeah, sure. Uh, wow, I've got a lot in here. Um, 80K. Is it not there? Um, I know I have it, obviously. User, find, star, grab. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, user, share. There we go. I don't know if I need to give it the EFI vars stuff for it to work. Oh, quieres quiero que yo hablo un poco de español? Sí. Ah, bienvenidos a la stream de español. Hoy escribe. Uh, code para uh, Linux uh, porque Linux no es rápido y uh, es malo para uh, Linux um, uh, 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 Linux is slow okay so now we should be able to cat a file to it um, which I really wish I kept that command around. Type a file. Um, cargo new bin. Uh, Linux thread model. Wow, what a what a good name. Um. Oh, uh, cargo build release. Eh, don't need to release yet. Uh, and then we'll target muscle. And then we're going to have nc192.168.1.11. Um... Uh, what port? <laughs> One, two, three, four. Cat. Run it and pipe it back. It'll send sig kill. Okay, so. Target. This. Linux thread model. Is that how that works? One nine two one six eight one dot eleven. Wrote file. Target debug. 
Uh, target this. We're gonna just make sure this is running it. Okay, that sent it, but um, we need to close. Um, I think we need to maybe we use hmm, send data here. No shutdown. This. Am I stupid? Am I stupid? I get the connection. Why is it not running it? And returned, wrote file. Am I just not being patient? Make a 16 meg buff, read it to end, wrote file. I'm, I'm doing something wrong here. Has an ex Microsoft security guy, what do you think about recall? I don't give a shit. <laughs> I just really don't care. <laughs> um This is weird. Connect Continue half duplex when receiving EOF on standard in. What the fuck? Red EOF. What? What? Oh, um, it's not static, is it? Is this not static by default? No, it's static. Static pi. I think that should be fine. Didn't do this with sock hat last time, did I? The Ult F4 stream, thank you so much for the raid. Holy shit. What are you working on today? Did I use SoCat? Why would I use SoCat? Uh sis emerge ask SoCat. Hello, readers. Yeah. Let's see. Because this, in theory, should do what I want. Is it not flushing it? Dump session. Allow. Because if I do this, it will just exit? Okay. Okay, that just works. And then what if I do a loop? I 
It looks like it works. Hello, hello. How's it going? Let's see. Okay, so did we mount proc? I don't think so. What what does Hornet do? Uh shut down, get there. Oh yeah, I guess I don't even need this because uh I get the output over here, don't I? <laughs> oh, I love Smart so much, chat. Beautiful. Beautiful. S'mores, I know. Isn't he the best? Okay, let's do... Uh, How many cores do we have? I hope they're all up. Let's see. Um, man, three mount? Man, four mount? Two mount. Okay. Libsy mount. Uh, I should be able to make a folder, right? Um, let's try this. Beautiful. Okay. Great proc mount proc fs and yeah let's do a, a standard fs reader on root uh, for file in this that file is file unwrap print file. Yep, bz image in it, these bytes, that's the file I dropped to run, and then proc. So yeah, this is very bare bones system. That's what I expected. I was making sure like nothing is somehow getting created, which shouldn't be. And now we'll do uh, libc. Okay. Libc uh, mount proc. Um... Source, procfs, proc, file system type, procfs, mount flag zero, data, standard pointer, null mute, that. Something like that. If this is equal to negative one, panic this standard error, error, last OS error, like that? Stan is that an aisle result, some shit? Uh, rust. You can use Rust new features C strings. What's that? I haven't I haven't seen that. Just C. Thank God. Okay, and then as pointer. Thanks, that's a big help. That's a lot better. Uh, and then this is uh, last OS error. God, that is so nice.
Uh, what is proc? Is it just proc proc? I think on uh, previous deal is proc FS. There we go. Okay. Okay, so now it's mounted a fuck ton. <laughs> uh... Chat, you ready to see some dank code? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now I should be able to do print len stern to fs read to string proc self maps. Yeah, let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Okay. Is the dog perf? Yeah, the dog's super perf. How's the puppy going? The puppy's doing amazing. He's doing such a good job. Look at him. Look at him. Okay, so this is our current processes map. And now we should be able to make some threads and do some uh, do some benchmarks. Oh yeah, how do I see how do I see like the number uh, cat proc CPU info? 191. How do you see like what processors are active? Rock. Are all of these active? Initial APIC ID. Hmm. I, I'm going to imagine that they're all there. Thoughts? I, I think I think all the processors are here. Okay. They're all active for some definition of active. Yeah. Yes. I didn't compile the kernel with cap sixty four processors. Is really what I was trying to check. Which I, I think we're I think we're good. I think we're in the clear. So we got our one hundred ninety two cores. So let's make a, a thread scope and let's spawn 192 threads. Let's go. Oh, I'm also curious what my pit is. Bam, 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 bam. Honestly, shouldn't we just make this no no standard? If I'm gonna do my custom a custom model anyways, I kind of just should, I think. Cause most of the existing Rust things don't really make any sense. 
Oh, randomized pin. Mounted proc. Bam. Okay. No standard will kill threads. Yeah, but I'm going to make threads, so... Th these are not the types of threads that I want. But let's uh, let's just do our benchmark anyways. Um, IT is standard time instant now. Lapsed. IT lapsed. And what are we going to do? We're going to map. We're going to do 4,000 maps. Uh, for sure, null mute, 4K, libc prot read, libc uh, map anon, libc map private, libc, uh, what's the important one? Map populate. Uh, not equal to libc map failed, I think. Let's see. Oh, map populate. Okay. Unsafe core pointer rate volatile and map as mute u84. We'll page that in. Oh, yep, and then uh, zero and negative one. Sorry, negative one and zero. Oh, that's unsafe as well. Here we go. Let's go. Let's go. Um... Oh, and <laughs> libc prot right. There we go. Okay. It's actually not too bad. Oh, that's just one. Oh, I see. Um, What's the baseline? So we're going to comment this out to see what the cost of spinning up the threads is. 6.47 millis. 6.4 millis. Yeah, it takes 6.4 millis just to create those threads. Isn't that fucking ridiculous? That's why we want to keep these threads on permanently. For blah in zero to b b one thousand. Okay, let's try this. Okay, let's go to let's go to ten thousand. Now they're actually competing. I want to see if any of them are finishing early. Yeah, you can see. Yeah, there's there's blocking, right? You can see how much blocking there is on these threads due to the way that they're coming in like that. Oh yeah, and let's uh let's send the kill command. One two one six eight one dot eleven one two three four uh one two three five. Um receive only. There we go. Okay, so that will kill everything on the system. So we can guarantee that we're the only thing running. Nice. Okay. So we're going to do uh, let uh, const thread. Eh. Let threads is equal to 192. Let iters is equal to 10,000 threads. Iters as sex F64. And we're going to do iters times threads as F64. So now we're going to see iterations per second. Um, okay. Bam. Mm, 10.3.
and let's build a uh, uh, release. And this isn't even fair because the M maps, the threads aren't even competing. 279,000 per second. Um. Wow. Uh, per core per second. Um, divided by threads. Enters per thread per second. A thousand. <laughs> Woof. Okay, and now. Um, how do I make sure that they all keep running? I guess here's what I can do. Uh, it's sometimes really hard to benchmark these things. Standard sync, atomic, atomic U64, uh, atomic U size, and ordering. New zero global iters uh let me iters is equal to zero for blah and zero to uh, let's do 100 so i'll have an inside loop and i'll say while it elapsed as sex eh. Lessons. while it is less than standard time duration from millis 1,000. Eh, 5,000. Well, it's less than that. Then we're going to do G iters fetch add 100. Honestly, it's going to be so cheap to check that time compared to this call that we can just do this. I don't think we need to batch our, our updates. Or, sorry. Uh, iters plus equals one. G iters fetch add. Uh, iters ordering uh, relaxed. Let iters jitters load ordering relax so what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to basically reduce the overhead of the benchmarking um and i want to make sure all of the cores are running the whole time during the benchmark i don't want i don't want like i don't want cores to be exiting really early because then there's not contention so i'm at that point i'm benchmarking like a, a ramp that's kind of falling off what i really want to see is how it behaves under contention so this should just run for five seconds and now this is just iters because that is global number of iters which is between all threads and let me do this we're going to set this to 1000 for testing print uh thread exited with iters and then hopefully these are roughly similar okay they're not even close wow okay uh that's fine um Okay, and then we'll go to 10 seconds and do a longer run here. And just see what this looks like. You can use standard sync barrier to synchronize all threads, make them compete for a resource. Yeah, I mean, that's built into the thread scope, right? The thread scope already has a barrier. So I'm, I'm using the thread scope barrier to block until they're all done and the threads are exited. And let's see how repeatable this data is. Wow, that's pretty good. 
Fair you at the end, but not at the start. Oh, I don't really care. With a 10 second run, the the six millisecond up ramp doesn't matter at all. I don't give a shit. Um, yeah, what is that error? What's what's six six over ten thousand? That's basically the the noise from that, right? That's why we did a long run. I just wanted to make sure that they all were contending during the whole thing. Otherwise, I think I think there are probably ones that would literally finish like. 10 millis in, like the first thread comes up, bangs out all the end maps before it's locked, and finishes, so. Yeah, that is very slow. Let's see what it is with one thread. You ready? So, this is ideal, like, this is ideally what we would get for performance. And maybe there's, yeah, look at that. Let's go, chat. That's what I'm fucking talking about. That is the data. That is the data that we're fucking here for, chat. Right there. Look at that. Look at that. Look at look at that shit. Isn't that ridiculous? Fucking terrible scaling. Terrible. Shit, Colonel.
He's eating his food. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, chat. Do you see what we're going to do? Does everyone see why this is so bad? Stamars is eating all of his food. <laughs> he's so happy. He's got to tell S'mores. <laughs> Isn't he the best? <laughs> okay. Um No, I'm just here for support. Oh yeah. Yeah, so um what we need to figure out <laughs> yep, and then I'll take them out in like 15 minutes. Hey Siri, set a timer for 15 minutes. Oh, you dumb bitch. Hey Siri, set a timer for 15 minutes. So I'll take them out in 15 minutes, but normally can eat and go a little bit longer. So, but that's mainly so I just don't forget. Okay, so yeah, here's what we want to do. Um... You saw how we were getting f 1,400 mmaps per second single-threaded. And multi-threaded, uh, sorry, multi-threaded we were getting 1,400 per second. Single-threaded we were getting 430,000 per second per core. Now, don't get me wrong, this there's 192 threads working here. So it's not actually that terrible overall but it's still actually worse 192 cores and mapping is literally slower literally slower than one core and mapping isn't that fucking insane like that that is why we're pursuing this like this is the sort of thing that this means that basically anyone software doesn't scale because fundamentally your memory management does not scale so if you're actively, like, mapping and unmapping stuff, it's just fucked. <laughs> like, heavy memory pressure on an allocator, it's, ba it's bad. So, also, check this out. Let's turn off map populate, which is my favorite mmap arg, should be default. Check this out. So, god damn it. So 430k uh, with populate. Let's just take some notes. Uh, 192 thread and map. Ooh, populate was... Oh, yeah, populate was faster. Okay. And map with map populate. Without map populate. We don't have that data yet. One thread and map without and with and then we'll have this is with this is without isn't that crazy so what map populate does is it fills in the page tables right away so by default mmap isn't actually going to page these in so there's actually two kernel transitions in in this so there's two kernel transitions because I have to mmap, which is a kernel transition for the syscall. And then when I do this right, that's another kernel transition because it has to flush the, um, it has to, uh, it's going to write to that, which is going to page fault, and then it's going to fault in a zero page. So map populate just says, uh, map that shit in the page tables already. I don't even know if it makes the page. I think it does. It doesn't guarantee it's in physical memory, but I think it's a pretty strong hint. Okay, so now let's do... Oops. Now we need the 192 without. There you go. Here's 192 without. And this should be the worst of all of them. Isn't that because of TLB shootdowns? Yes. Inherently shared memory models do not scale if you don't have exclusive memory regions and areas. Yeah, there you go. 
so this is um this is actually this and this is actually uh this that right so there are the like the global numbers so obviously one thread and mapping map populate is just slaughtering okay now um what we want to do is we want to see if we can get this times 192 which would be this times 192 maps a second uh which would be incredible right i'd love 82 million maps a second given that in this threading case we're getting 1400 a second so what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to make processes and I don't really know how I want to do this. I do need to figure out dinner plans. Um, one second. I think my friends want to go out for dinner. Dude, why is the swipe keyboard so fucking bad on Apple phones? Do 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 do. Uh. Okay. I hate Siri the most. It feels out outdated. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Chat. This is where I think we're going to wrap it up for today. I'm going to go get some food. And to get food, I need to get s'mores tired. So I'm going to go and play with s'mores for an hour and get him exhausted so he passes out. Uh, make sure he gets his peas and poops in. But we'll be back to do some more probably pretty soon. I do like this project. I mean, now that we have an environment set up, we can actually write code. Um, but this is showing me that there is significant room for a gain. So the theoretical goals would be this times 192. So this, which is probably not possible. Like doing these times 192 is not possible because some of these are hyper threads and we'll probably start running into like system scaling issues. And also, we're probably just going to run out of RAM. So we might have to do these with um, one map in the loop as well. But anyways, this is the goal, right? And what would this goal be? If we hit this goal, this goal, we would have a speed up of 305. So it'd be a 305x speed up of M mapping, which then will help us with Oh, is he humping that stuffed animal? Um, a 305x speedup uh, actually makes some mapping and page table based data structures viable because with many threads, like if you have an aggressive uh, data structure that's relying on like copy on writes or forks or like lazy paging, um, this 300x speedup will very likely be the allowance for some very exotic data structure designs that are otherwise infeasible with normal memory models. Basically, we can we can have M maps in some of our semi-hot paths. So, okay, I'm going to go take s'mores out and play with him. I know it's a short stream, but uh, I don't like leaving him for too long. I like uh, keeping up on him. So, yeah, we'll see what we can do. Uh, keep in mind, these goal numbers will probably get half that due to hyper-threading. Um, and we'll probably have to M-map and MUN-map in a loop, but that's okay. Because any realistic thing that's hammering M-maps is also going to be hammering MUN-maps. Otherwise, you're going Oom. Um, unless you're doing, like, M-protect. But even M-protects... Um, let's make a note. Uh, benchmark with MUN-map. Benchmark with M-protect. Benchmark with... Um, M map of the same address on each thread. 
which this maybe will help with data structure lookups. I don't think so, because I think it's just a linked list. This maybe needs fewer locks, and this means uh, not growing memory use, so less uh, PM physical memory uh, um, cost, right? So we want to get kind of all these benchmarks to see what kind of speed ups we're getting in what environments, but we'll go and do that another day. Thank you so much for stopping by. Please join my Discord. Uh, pound uh, Discord. There's the dis. My bot's dead. Okay, let me generate a Discord link. Join the Discord. Um, we're pretty chill. Pretty uh, pretty just laid back and relaxed. So here is uh, the Discord link if you want to join that. I'm pretty active in that kind of throughout the day here and there. Um, I don't stream too much. But uh, we'll see with the puppy and maybe doing some shorter streams and weaving it in between some work and taking the puppy up. Maybe I can uh, make this work. So thanks for stopping by. See you later.